Hello and uh, welcome to the second lunch talk of the Carbs Asia in the new year. My name is Gianfranco Guidati. I will be your host for this event today. And our speaker is uh, Stefan Schneider from the University of Geneva. And I'm very much looking forward to, to Stefan's talk, who will enlighten us on the subject of temperature reduction district heating networks. So Stefan, the floor is yours. Okay. Th thank you, Gianfranco, for this uh, very nice introduction. Okay, the subject, uh, temperature reduction on the district, existing district uh, heating substation is a broad subject. I could speak a long time, I guess. But today in this short lecture, I will try to give you a quick overview. Uh, finally, it's nice to dig into some case study to illustrate a bit what uh, happens in uh, real situations. Um, so the first, uh, to give a general framework, I show you a small example illustrating the benefits of lowering district heating temperature levels in the context of renewable heat to see where we are today and where we could go. We could go. I show you uh, two benchmarks on temperature levels, uh, one in Switzerland, one in Dan Denmark. And once we, we have a given situation, it's also interesting to see what we can do. So what are possible strategies to, to lower these temperature levels? And uh, I will end up with a case study uh, on a low temperature district heating network uh, in Geneva. And uh, finally, some conclusions that hopefully will uh, lead to a stimulating discussion. So the, we suppose here that we have a geothermal resource with a temperature level of uh, 65 degrees with a flow rate of 40 liter, liters per second. So if we are able to achieve a delta T of 25 degrees, that means to re-inject the water with a temperature of 40 degrees, this will lead to a thermal power of um, 4.1 megawatts. So depending on the operating levels of the district heating, we may require assistance of a heat pump. So we will, uh, depending on the temperature level of the district heating, we have much uh, different levels of uh, required he uh, heat pump assistance to use this uh, geothermal uh, heat source. The first case, for example, that is a very, not a very good situation. If we need a supply temperature of 110 degrees and we have a, a return temperature of 70 degrees, we need a full assistance of the heat pump since the return, return temperature of the district heating is above the temperature of the geothermal resource. In the second case here, we, we have a uh, supply temperature of 75 degrees. So we here need only a temperature lift of 10 degrees. And in this case, uh, we have a partial uh, assistance of the heat pumps that will, uh, of course, uh, we will use uh, much less electricity as in this case where we have a very high temperature uh, lift to achieve. The last case, which is uh, the most uh, favorable, is uh, if we have by chance a temperature uh, district heating network that can operate at the level of the resource, we can make a direct use of the uh, geothermal resource. And if by chance the return temperature of the district heat um, network is 40 degrees, we can use directly this 4.1 megawatt without any assistance of uh, the uh, heat pump. So this is really a, a case where we have just a pumping uh, energy. Uh, so we have a, a much lower electricity consumption. So this gives you just one idea what are the benefits uh, in the context of uh, renewable heat. So uh, now we, if we go to, to see a bit what is uh, the situation in Switzerland, here I show you a very nice benchmark uh, done by Loic Kikres. So we have here 12 uh, district heating networks where we, here we have in red the supply temperature, the average one, which is uh, represented here by these red lines. And we have the, in blue, the return temperatures. The x-axis uh, represents the amount of uh, annual heat delivered. So we have here the big 
uh, district heating networks, and here the, the small one. So what we see is that we have really temperatures that range between, let's say, 65 up to 110 degrees. And we have nearly most return temperatures that are higher than 50 degrees. We don't see any clear relation between size of the district uh, heating network and the temperature levels. Now, if we go a bit to Denmark, we have here, let's say, a, a similar um, a benchmark on much more um, substations. So we have here, um, we see here ranked according to the return temperature. Here you have the return temperature on, uh, on the bottom of these district heating networks and on top the supply temperatures. And if we compare this to the average uh, values we have in Switzerland, we see really that, uh, okay, maybe we can do some progress. Huh? We are much higher at return temperature. Uh, really, we have only, let's say, uh, there are only a few uh, substations that, that perform at our um, um, average return temperature level. So this seems to indicate that we, maybe we can do something huh, in Switzerland. Well, so uh, once we have uh, observed this, what can we do? Uh, before going uh, further, I will really recall some very basic principle uh, of district heating networks. So in its uh, simplest version, we have a power plant here that provides hot water at a supply temperature which is distributed through insulated pipes to the buildings. And each building has a substation where uh, it, will, uh, it will be able to use the heat for space heating and domestic hot water. And now this water returns at a lower temperature back to the plant uh, uh, through also through insulated pipes. So, um, what you control as an operator is the supply temperature. So you decide, okay, I will distribute, let's say at 80 degrees. Well, what do we ultimately need in buildings? In buildings, we need for space heating between 40 and 60 degrees, depending on the building type and its uh, heat distribution system. If you have radiators or floor heating makes a difference. And for domestic hot water, we need higher levels if we have a domestic hot water storage uh, because of Legionella issues. But what you do not control as an operator is the return temperature. Each substation gets you back. If this one gives you back 75 degrees, you cannot do something as an operator. You must just accept this situation. So what uh, influences this uh, return temperature? This can be the architecture of the substation, the efficiency of the heat uh, exchanges, and the hydraulic regulation of the heat uh, distribution system of the building. So the problematic substations are the ones that return the water at a high temperature level. Now, uh, what can be the effect of uh, only one substation? I will illustrate this by a very simple example, which is uh, purely theoretical, but uh, uh, illustrating the problem. So we suppose that we have a, a district heating network with a supply temperature of 50 degrees. We imagine having five substations for good ones that achieve a delta T of, 30, of 15 degrees. It means that they return the, the water at 35 degrees. And we have, a, let's say, a bad user that achieves only a delta T of 5 degrees. So it returns the, the water at 45 degrees. So we suppose that all buildings have the same heat demand for simplicity, let's say 200 megawatt per year. And then uh, based on this average delta T and demand, you can uh, calculate a, a total a water flow, mass flow that is used by the substations. So the, the bad one uses three times more uh, mass flow because uh, you have mass flow, mass flow times delta T gives you the energy. So if you have a, a delta T, which is three times 
smaller, you need three times more water. And you return much more water at a higher temperature. So this has a double effect. Huh? So in this example, only this substation um, will uh, have as I expect that the average, the mix of the, 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 the return temperature you get, which is the mix of these five substations will be 39 degrees. And so this only uh, substation has an influence of more than four degrees on the, compared to the situation it would do as the other one. Huh? So you, you see that one substation can have a substantial uh, effect and we really see that in the case study as well. So um, first, uh, before presenting this tool, I would like to mention that there exist also much more sophisticated methods, but they, that uh, methods rely on daily data to detect faults uh, more quickly. But uh, this uh, tool at the advantage, it's free. You can download it at this uh, address. It works with this Excel. And as you will see, it requires only a very few data to, to make a ranking of your substations. Uh, so uh, to make the analysis, uh, we need for each uh, substation, we need uh, the consumed uh, heat of the building. So this can be annual uh, readings, for example, and the total volume uh, that passed through the substation, uh, the total mass flow uh, of uh, this substation did, did consume. And you must set up, an, let's say, a target value for your delta T. This is a target you want to reach. And uh, this target, we call it this uh, delta T ref. And the method is to, compute, to compare the actual volume consumed by the substation with a volume, an optimized one, that would be the volume consumed by the substation if we would have reached this, uh, this uh, target delta T. So to illustrate how it works, I, I entered into the tool, this uh, very simple example of these five substations we just see. So what you have to in, uh, put, uh, you put here as input your, your de reference delta T. So I put here this 15 degrees. I also entered the, the consumption of this substation. So this 200 megawatts and the used volume by each substation. And so this, uh, Tool, we calculate this additional volume, which will be V minus uh, V ref. And it calculates also uh, the contribution, the influence this uh, substation has on the average overall return temperature of the network. And this is exactly the value I computed by hand in, in my example. And if we see, uh, we have a ranking and we see this substation has a rank one, so this uh, can be identified as a primary target for an action. So uh, what can be now the possible causes? So one cause can be the architecture. So just, uh, I show you just two examples of the architecture. So here in the, upper, in the upper picture, you have a very simple design, but it's quite modern a design where you have two exchangers in parallel, one for the space heating and what's one for the domestic hot water. And the advantage, advantage is you can uh, control these two flows uh, separately and this is completely individual. You don't have interactions. What we still see in some times is a design like this. And the problem with this, this design is the highest temperature level we need which is the one for domestic water, hot water is behind two exchangers. And here we have an independence of the flows with the circuit for domestic, uh, for space heating. So this uh, can really cause a prob cause problem concerning the performance. And we can have very high return temperatures here when we use uh, the domestic hot water. And this correlates with the space heating. So this is a bit problematic. So why do we have this? Uh, we have this simply because often we had here a fossil boiler. And then when the building was connected to the, to the, the district heating network, this uh, boiler was just replaced by an exchanger. So we have this as an heritage uh, from the old design. 
Another cause can uh, be um, is, can be on can be regulation issues. So I show you here an example where we have um, <clears throat> um, two different set temp uh, temperature set points which are regulated. So here we have let's say a normal situation. Uh, we uh, regulate here a set point at 35 degrees, which is enough for, for domestic space heating even if we have uh, 50 degrees available. And this controller here will open this regulation valve at, at a minimum uh, to get uh, to have here the minimal flow to achieve this temperature. And here you see uh, um, uh, um, uh, uh, um, representation of these temperature levels. And uh, if see, we will have a higher mass flow on the secondary side in this case, and since mass flow times delta T is constant because uh, of energy conservation, we have here a smaller delta T. And for this reason, we can have here on the primary side, um, a close temperature, to a temperature that is close to the one you get back from the secondary side. So this is, let's say, an optimal uh, situation concerning the return temperature. Now, if we imagine that this, temperature set point is set very high, even sometimes it's set higher than what the district heating can supply. In this case, the controller will open this valve at maximum, trying to reach here this uh, 52 degrees we cannot reach. And then we have a very high mass flow here on the primary side this time. And as consequence, we have a very small delta T here on the primary side. And this time, this two temperatures will be close. And we have a huge temperature gap on the cold side of the exchanger. So in this case, <clears throat> you will get a very high uh, return temperature. So this really seems a bit silly. How can we do something like this? Does something happen in reality? And we will see that it's surprising, but uh, if, if you look at this benchmark, uh, where we have, they, they, they looked at a, a benchmark of more than 500 folds identified on, on a substation in, in Sweden. And we see that this set point uh, regulation is the most frequent problem. So this is uh, very simple to, to, to solve maybe, but uh, it happens often in the praxis. Okay, now um, I gently go to the, the case study I wanted to show you. So this is a, um, a, a district in Geneva, which is called Le Berger. It's uh, um, 33 buildings that uh, represent 1,350 dwellings that are co connected to a low temperature district heating network. Um, this uh, network takes uh, heat from a geothermal resource, which is a shallow geothermal water, which is first used in a district cooling uh, network where you have industrial uh, heat um, um, rejection. Then this water goes to the evaporator of a centralized heat pump, of five megawatts. The produced heat is, um, is injected into this uh, network. And um, you have also a connection to the high temperature district heating network of Geneva as a backup and, um, and sometimes as an additional supply. Uh, one particularity of this district heating network is that it has two operating modes. During the heating mode, the temperature is set to 50 degree, 50 degree supply temperature. And twice a day, it, it switches to a domestic hot water mode during two hours, where the temp supply temperature is uh, set up to, to 65 degrees uh, to heat up the domestic hot water buffers in the buildings. Uh, so this graph shows the hourly cup uh, in both modes, so in heating mode, yeah, and in domestic hot water mode. And you have the hourly cup depending on the temperature lift uh, on the evaporator inlet. So higher is the temperature um, uh, uh, at the entry, so higher is the return temperature of the network, so higher is the temperature lift. And you see that in heating mode, you have a very high influence uh, 
on the cup. Uh, so the return temperature is really a critical thing. When you have high return temperature, you have a, a much lower cup and higher electricity demand. And even sometimes the uh, heat pump has to be shut down uh, to protect it because uh, up a certain level, it cannot continue to work. <clears throat> So um, we, the substation uh, of this, uh, net, this uh, district heating uh, network uh, are like this. You have two exchangers in parallel. Uh, the upper one is uh, for the heating mode. So here you transfer heat to the heat uh, distribution system for, for space heating. So when we are in heating mode, this valve is open and here some water normally at a gentle flow went to here to get these 35 degrees here to distribute heat for the space heating. And during the, the two batches, when we are in domestic hot water mode, the heating valve will close, the domestic hot water valve will uh, open, and here we will uh, heat up the domestic hot water buffers. So uh, the method used to, to make a benchmark on these substations was to compute an average return temperature which is uh, weighted by the flow rate on the primary side of the substation. And we also computed the annual heat demand. So as hypothesis, we, we uh, want to reach a target of 15 degrees uh, between supply and return uh, temperature. So we'll have 30, 50, 35 in heating mode and 65, 50 in domestic hot water mode. And we identify the domestic hot water mode by uh, the time when uh, we have these batches. And the data I show you is uh, over one year. It's uh, from 1st October 2020 to 1st October 21. So these graphs, in these graphs, you have on the y axis the average temperature difference, and on the x axis the uh, annual heat demand for each uh, substation. On the left side for the space heating mode and the right side for the domestic hot water mode. What we, we see, uh, first thing we see in the domestic hot water mode, most substations do not reach the target of uh, 15 degrees. For space heating mode, more or less half of the substations. And now if we go in this direction down right, uh, you have a lower temperature difference and a higher demand. You will also uh, higher, have a higher influence on the return temperature. So we intuitively see that X2 will have the highest influence in the, in the space heating mode and the X32 substation in the domestic hot water uh, mode. Now we applied uh, this Excel tool to uh, this data um, and we ranked the substations according to the influence on the, on the overall uh, return temperature. And we see here our problematic uh, substation X2, which is the most problematic one on, the, on this uh, network, as uh, this only substation has an influence and more of a half degree on the overall uh, return average uh, return temperature on the on the district uh, heating. So this is a case study. We will look a bit in details. What is the the fault reason for this one? Then it's also interest, it's interesting to look at a very good substation that functions good in both mode, in a heating mode and in a domestic hot water mode. And here we look at the substation which uh, functions very well in heating mode, but seems to have a problem in domestic hot water mode. So if we go to X2, uh, what I, I uh, in this graph, you have the daily average uh, temperature difference. So this is the target value of 15 degrees. The red one is the average we reach. And the first thing we, we, so we see that the problem is not always here. You have uh, days where everything seems to work fine. And here suddenly you have, you have a very, very uh, small temperature difference in, in, in heating mode, okay? Uh, same for domestic hot water mode. So the, the problems are not permanent. They are sometimes uh, at some moments. Huh? 
So uh, it's interesting to see what happens during this moment here, for example, in October, where you have still a bit of space heating and you have uh, mostly domestic hot water uh, as demand. Uh, so um, yeah, the first thing we, we observe uh, here on the, this graph here on the back, you have the volumet volumetric flow uh, of the substation. And we see it's, it's permanently at a very high level of uh, 32 cubic meter per hour, even when there is no load. Huh? So even when there is uh, no demand at all, you have a very high flow. And the consequence of this uh, situation is that here, the temperatures, huh, this, this, uh, in green, you have the, uh, the supply temperature um, on the primary side. Here you have, it's really equal. So you have here this delta T of nearly zero. So um, this is probably an incorrect uh, behavior of the valve that is always open, or it's maybe also an issue of the setup temperature uh, as we see. Huh? So this we, we cannot know with additional information, but we are clearly in, the, in this situation um, I illustrated before, which is also the most, uh, the most frequent uh, regulation issue we have in, in substations. So here really there are, is something has to be controlled either on the valves or in the setup of the regulation automatic. If we go uh, now to a, a substation that has a normal behavior, a good behavior in domestic hot water. Uh, so we have here really um, a target value that is uh, um, average value that is even better than the target value as a difference. So here again, I show you the same graphs than before. You have here the volumetric flow. So here in this case, we see everything is normal between the batches you have here, which are these uh, demand peaks here. The, everything closes, huh? this valve completely closes. This is always closed because we are in summer. So the volumetric flow stops. So this is a uh, uh, very, this is uh, uh, normal. And this is uh, also, uh, it should be like this. And what you also see here in green, it's very interesting. Yeah? This is as a, the return, temp, the, the solid line is the supply temperature of the district heating network and the dotted one, the return temperature. So here we see that uh, the return temperature never goes ab uh, above uh, 50 degrees. Huh? So we see here that this water here returns at 50 degrees, so we are, we are maybe here a bit uh, lower even, but this means that in this domestic hot water buffer, we have a quite good stratification and everything works fine. Now we have, uh, we, we look at the same uh, situation, domestic hot water um, uh, production, but here it works a bit less good. We have only an average temperature of a difference of 10 degrees. So let's look a bit what happens here. Um, so here in this case, uh, we have again the same graphs. Here we have the volumetric flow that is zero when we are outside of the batches. So this is normal. So here everything works well. Um, here we have these peaks of demands that correspond to these batches where we load this, uh, this uh, domestic hot water buffer. But here again, if we look at the supply and return temperature here on, on the primary side of the, the, the domestic hot water exchanger, we see, we see here that the return temperature is it's much higher. It goes uh, even close to 60 degrees. So compared to the other situation where we were always below 50 degrees, we have here much higher much, uh, returns with, with a much higher temperature. So why this? Uh, there can be two uh, reasons for this. Huh? It, maybe this exchanger is undersized. This is one possibility, but not very, uh, I think it's, this is not the reason in this case, because everything was well studied uh, and there were some very um, uh, strict guidelines that were given to the dimensioning of these exchanges. So what is more probable, is that here we have a very high uh, return temperature on the, on the secondary side of this exchanger. And this can be uh, because this 
volumetric flow here is too high and the stratification is lost here. This is uh, one reason or the buffer is too small. This can be also the case. Huh? So uh, this is here it must be really investigated what, what happens at the level of this uh, domestic hot water buffer. Okay, so after all this uh, information, there was a lot of information I know, but I will try to make a very synthetic uh, conclusion of all this. Um, the first thing that we can see, say, is uh, when we compare these uh, benchmarks between Switzerland and, and Denmark, we, we have the feeling that we have some room for temperature level optimization, optimization on our networks. But in the practice, it's a very difficult process because we have uh, sometimes very old substations that has, have to be retrofitted. It's sometimes not um, easy to get uh, all required information to, to make uh, a diagnostic. <clears throat> um, so district heating operator, he does not control the substation return temperature. And that is, this is a major issue. So you have uh, the problem is really at a decentralized level uh, with maybe with often many different stakeholders. So this is, uh, is really a challenge also on the organization on the of organizing this uh, optimization. So if you want to improve the situation, a first step may be to identify the substations that sh that should be optimized in priority. This can be. Uh, on the basis only on annual readings, you have uh, in most cases uh, done by the billing, um, by the readings done for the for the billing, and then uh, once you have target your your priority substations, you have to 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 identify the causes. So this can be hardware issues either on the on the substation architecture on the size of the heat exchangers. Sometimes you have to replace maybe your substation in very, uh, uh, in some situations. It can be reg regulation issues on the primary side, for example, the control valves, the temperature set point uh, that is not well adapted or other things. It can be issues on the secondary side. You have bad hydraulic balance. You have uh, um, uh, hydraulic flows that are much too high in, in your, in your uh, heat distribution system. Uh, the problem can be permanent or can some occur at some times. So it's in interesting to see if there are some special moments when you have the problem. Uh, but to do all this, you require detailed data. Uh, this is, uh, in, in most cases, not, not available. Uh, but OK, this is also an issue, of course. But even if detailed uh, data is av available, as, as in our case study in this district, uh, in the practice, uh, there is no automatic dysfunction control, huh? uh, which is something that maybe should be put in place when you have this data. Uh, the, the district heating operator should maybe on a daily basis uh, control that uh, each uh, substation is uh, functioning, is functioning uh, normally. I think one issue, uh, because we uh, things are not moving, huh? if you do your billing only on consumed energy, you don't give a price signal to, to, to solve the issue because uh, even if your substation uh, has a delta T of five degrees, your energy bill will be the same. If the bill would be on consumed volume, this is maybe a bit extreme, or if you add a bonus or a malus but based on return temperature, you would give a price signal to the, to the customer. And this would really also uh, put, uh, give a motivation and accelerate things. And to fi uh, finish, I give you some um, references uh, that we were used in this, uh, in this uh, presentation. And uh, thank you very much for your attention. And I, I'm happy to continue the discussion. Thank you very much, uh, Stefan. I, I really enjoyed it. I really underst understood now what, what the problems are and so on.